Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. It's going to be a little bit different this week because one of the things we like to do at Ascend is to have our members speak for themselves. And today our member is the established author, Anne Mordavin, uh, who will be discussing her very successful new book, Being Seen. Will, would you take it from there, please? Gladly. And tell us about your new book. So my book is called Being Seen. Uh, it is a memoir. Its subtitle is a memoir. Oh, it's inside the page. I should know it by heart, too. A memoir about me, an autistic mother, a French immigrant, and a Zen student. So the book follow a um, chronological order and basically those three parts are in chronological order. Part one is um, when I grew up in France. Uh, part two is when I arrived in the United States. I lived in Chicago. And then the last part, three, is when I uh, arrived to California and started a Zen practice. And the book is kind of informed by that. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the first part, uh, which is when you uh, came into the world as an autistic child in France. Well, uh, so I was born in 1964 in uh, Les Sables which is a little town on the um, west coast by the Atlantic Ocean. And this part of my life, I was not diagnosed yet. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody knew what my strange behaviors at times, mm -hmm. <laughs> were, what they were about. Mm -hmm. And as I say many times, well, I said in the book and I said a lot, uh, for me, especially at that time and in France, not being diagnosed was my saving grace. However, it's a very difficult one because nowadays services are much better. I've met many younger people who obviously have been helped tremendously by being diagnosed. I have myself been basically my, my I was dying out there, when, but that's when I was 46 in the United States. When you were diagnosed. What's the difference about uh, being diagnosed in France? Is that a particular issue? You were, not, you were diagnosed in the United States, I understand. Yes, I was right. diagnosed in the United States. But you said it was your saving grace. What did you mean by in that? In France, not to be diagnosed. What do I mean by that? Well, France, I mean, that was back in the 1970s. And, you know, France was not really that great with autism. I, I mean, and the great thing is that I came to the United States, nobody believed me. I kept saying, I don't want to have anything to do with, autism, with France. And nobody was like, what are you talking about? And now it came out. France, when it comes to autism, is, well, they are really trying to make efforts, and I don't want to offend them. And, but let's face it, when I was a child, if I had been diagnosed, it would have mean institution right away. It would have mean I would have been destroyed, and I would not be here now. Why don't you read a short passage from your book or give us some idea what, it, right. what it's like. To... Okay. So I'm going to read uh, from um, page, well, actually, it's chapter five. And I'm going to start with um, just like this. Once I had a fist fight with Bruno in the schoolyards. A few months later, Bruno ganged up with Luc, we were on the same tennis team, and another boy, and the three of them threw bits of foxtails at me in order to taunt me. I was paralyzed with fear and unable to move. One foxtail crawled so near my throat and mouth that I became obsessed with the thought that I would swallow it. The cafeteria lunch took up 30 minutes during which I usually obsessed about food and contamination. I believe that only packaged food that had not been touched was safe. Thus, in the school's cafeteria, I only ate the food that was served wrapped, mainly crackers and yogurts, and this left me hungry. 
Maybe to make up for this, on my way to and from school every day, I stopped at a candy store and bought a lot of candy. Eventually, I became addicted to sugar, and on top of the candy stores, I often biked every day to several pastry shops in order to buy two or three pastries at a time. Naturally, the change money my parents gave me every month was not enough to sustain this habit, so I stole coins from my mom's purse, despite her anger when she happened to notice it. The school's midday break lasted two hours. This meant that after lunch in the cafeteria, I had 90 minutes of unstructured time before resuming classes. It deeply hurt that I was not accepted in the little groups of students that were scattered on the grounds with Marie, a longtime childhood friend, in one of them. At first, I huddled in hidden places to read, but eventually I developed another obsession. I kicked a pebble over and over around the yard. I tried to keep the same pebble day after day, noticing where I left it at the end of the lunch break so I could use it again the next day. I counted how much the pebble traveled, wondering if it had made it to China yet. Would I ever be able to travel thus? It is no surprise then that the school requested I no longer eat lunch at the school's cafeteria. Instead, I went home and my brother followed. I was the custom in France, as was the custom in France. My mother also had a long lunch break during which she had barely enough time to come home and cook. It may have been an added responsibility for my mother as it increased her already full load, but to her credit, she never made me feel guilty. At home during lunch, my father, my mother, my brother, and I were now together, which I liked much better than the school's cafeteria. The problem with a child not being given reason for changes like this is that then she may think it's her fault, as I did. I took much pain to hide my different perception and the ensuing behaviors. Not being diagnosed autistic as a child was my saving grace. Had I been dragged to doctors, I may have been labeled and looked down at. An autistic diagnostic label can be cause for troubles, and especially at that time in France. Many teachers and other support staff feel superior to their diagnosed charge, and opportunities are denied, which can be perceived so overwhelming by an autistic person that we may fall into the abysses leading to mental illnesses, med medical drugs, institutions, or suicide and other problems. When autism is thought to be a disease that must be cured, the fragile and nervous child might be destroyed by an inappropriate tr treatment. We're often so sensitive, it is as if we had an insincerity meter and the smugness of the people around us who are often completely unaware of it may seriously rock us. On the other hand, I have now met many younger autistic people for whom being diagnosed autistic has had several positive effects on the individual. As a teacher friend told me, how can I help if I do not know the child has a challenge? Allowing access to the now much improved services can obviously be very helpful. The answer to the situation is not simple at all. Autism has many facets, and I certainly do not have all the answers. Stacy, I understand that you now have a question for Anwar. Yes, I do. I uh, understand that in your book that you have this enthusiasm of, about basic Zen practices, and I was wondering if you would like to talk about that and how has it helped you? Yes, I have a lot of enthusiasts for my Zen mm -hmm. practice. Yeah. Um, I started it uh, 17 years ago, and uh, how has it helped me? Zen is a very, or I don't know, the spiritual, for me, it's a very subtle thing, and it's kind of difficult to express it all at once. I mean, I really, I know I repeat myself with it, but I really like that image, maybe you guys haven't heard it, of a recipe. It's not mine. Uh, it's, you know, you may know it by heart, you may have all the ingredients and you be, you know, you're ready for it, but until you actually 
do it, you really don't know it. Same with Zen practice. Mm -hmm. um, how has, I, I keep coming to this, how has it helped me? Well, first I, I had, because I went to live in a Zen, uh, Zen center for six months, I, I developed, I saw with my own eyes how it has an effect on those who've been doing it for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. How it changes a person with a more open being more open, being uh, being kinder. So I, I started to. Um, when I sit zazen, for me, that's the main part of my uh, zen practice. Is my sitting um, zazen every single day at home, and when I do that, it's there is this <sighs> quiet and silence, mm -hmm. and in this. What is zazen? Zazen is sitting meditation. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I guess I, it's not clear. Okay. No, no problem. So anyway, it's, it, it kind of feels like in that stillness, things can come out. And slowly mm -hmm. but surely, the wheel of my life came back on track. Yeah, I mean, according to others, too, it's like meditation, even like moving type, like Tai Chi. I took that in college before that it has big you know, quite helpful and really, you know, great in their life, you know, aside from being medicated, you know, I mean, not that that's bad to do or anything, it's just um, meditation seems to be like the more natural way of, you know, of just getting relief and just really calming and centering yourself as it goes yes, up. Yes, I yes. noticed, a, and um, also I, I noticed the little statue here is, of the Buddhism, um, that's th uh, each of these uh, uh, on your book uh, represent, you know, French immigrant and Zen student and the little ballerina. Is that the? <laughs> well, that's not my Zen mom? practice. <laughs> no, 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 no. But the, the Zen practice. Um, yeah. You yeah, know, no. I know little, it's okay. But no problem. So, so um, the little um, ballerina mm -hmm. is the. Uh, music box actually oh and what it for me it's very emotional uh -huh. because uh okay so it belonged to my dad who i think was probably himself autistic mm -hmm. and uh the action my dad and i both when i was little were totally um engrossed in it in the rewinding it and the same motion again and again and again and then i think another thing is um for me, uh, I often felt like I was behind glass. Right. So like, you know, the little ballerina in many ways. Well, also another obsession, uh, if you ever read my book, was about classical mm -hmm. dancing. So anyway, oh, yes. I got totally, with my dad, totally obsessed in it. So much so that my mom gave it to me. And so now I, I have it. Awesome. That's the story. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. This has been very interesting, Anne-Laure, and one thing I'm interested in, and I'm sure our viewers are as well, is where can they find out more about your book and where can they get it? Yes, so, well, I have a website. Uh, that website is annlauredaven.com, mm -hmm. and I post everything. I've had many uh, interviews and uh, there are events, and there is also my re you know, reviews by other people. And actually, uh, another I mean, the, another place is that my book is on Amazon, mm -hmm. so you can find it on Amazon and other Barnes and Nobles and others like that. And um, you can buy it there. <laughs> Excellent, and I understand it's doing very well, and we're very pleased to hear that. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Anne Lore. Thank you. Everyone, for this week, uh, this has been Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. Greg Yates. And Lord Davin. Stacey Kennedy. Until next time, very best to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>